A warning to our listeners and viewers. We turn now to a story that includes graphic video and accounts of state violence. We begin today's show in Nigeria, where there's growing evidence to confirm security forces fired without warning on peaceful protesters Tuesday night, killing at least 12 people, as authorities imposed a curfew to clamp down on growing demonstrations against police brutality. Video shared widely on social media shows security forces in Lagos firing directly into a crowd of demonstrators who were singing Nigeria's national anthem. <laughs> issued a report Wednesday that it was Nigeria's security forces that fired on the protesters. U.N. High Commissioner for Human Rights Michelle Bachelet issued a statement that, quote, there is little doubt that this was a case of excessive use of force resulting in unlawful killings with live ammunition by Nigerian armed forces, she said. Amnesty International also said it received reports that shortly before the shootings, electricity was cut off for security cameras in the area where protesters had camped. At least 56 people have died during two weeks of widespread demonstrations in Nigeria, including 38 on Tuesday. The killings come two weeks after protests began against a branch of the Nigerian police known as SARS, the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, which has long been accused of committing torture, murder and extortion. The killings have sparked outrage from Nigerians across the globe. The soccer star, Odiana Glalo, who plays for Manchester United, posted this video online. I'm sad and broken. I don't know where to start from. Uh, I'm not the kind of guy that talks about politics, but I can't keep quiet anymore for what is going on back home in Nigeria. I would say Nigerian government you guys are ashamed to the world for killing your own citizens, sending military to the street to kill unarmed full protesters because they are protesting for their rights. It's uncalled for. Today, 20th of October 2020, you people will be remembered in the history as the first government that sent military to the city to start killing their own citizens. Well, for more, we go to Nigeria, where we're joined by two guests. In Abuja, the capital of Nigeria, we're joined by Shwari Amoyle. He is a Nigerian journalist, a human rights activist, and founder and publisher of Sahara Reporters. He also ran for president in Nigeria and has been imprisoned there. In Lagos, the most populous city in Nigeria, which is the most populous uh, state uh, country in the African continent, we're joined by Adaranke Ige, a human rights activist and lawyer who works with the organization Corporate Accountability and Public Participation Africa. Ige has been participating participating in the NSARS protests. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! We're going to start in Lagos, where those fatal killings happened, the fatal shootings happened on Tuesday night. At Aranke Ige, you've been out on the streets. Describe what's happened and talk about the level of peaceful protest that has been going on against this police unit and police brutality in general. Thank you. Um I cannot even begin to try to describe in words the kind of barbaric action of the Nigerian government that we saw play out on Tuesday here in Lagos. Now, these protests have been sustained, have been peaceful, have been the most, you know, a lot of people would tend to say, oh, we don't even know the leaders. It's not, you know, all of that. But it has been one of the most coordinated protests or demonstrations that you have ever seen without any face or any tag of leadership. That's how we have been conducting ourselves for the past two weeks. And you could see that there was raw passion, there was energy to just salvage the soul of our collective good of our country, Nigeria. And a lot of young people have been at the forefront, just everybody demanding in unity and in, in, in oneness. What are we asking for? We're asking for justice. We're asking for our lives 
to be preserved, not to be killed arbitrarily by, the, um, by these officers of state called SARS, that special anti-robbery squad, but then even beyond SARS, by the Nigerian police, by the Nigerian military, it looks like everything about Nigeria is just forceful, and especially with this government, it's been totally arbitrary, has been full of impunity, and just a setup against the people. So that's all we've been asking for, and it's been totally organized, and that's what we have demonstrated. In fact, to the applause of everyone, who has seen it. But then, rather than the Nigerian government taking um, action, heeding to these demands and just being responsible, what we saw was, you know, what a lot of us have been seeing over the years, which, good enough, is now coming to the full glare of the, of, of the globe. Now, we have seen where government, rather than heed to the voices of its citizens, would rather turn against them, oppress them, and even further intimidate them for asking not to be intimidated. So what happened on Tuesday was um, the anticlimax of everything. So in, in the last two weeks, we've been on the street just, um, just chanting, just making our voices heard, demanding what we have been asking for as usual. But then the government, like a thief in the night, that it has always been, went out. Now, in the early evening, around 4.03 p.m., there had been messages. In fact, one of us captured um, some officers wearing certain uniforms, tampering with the closed-circuit camera TV, you know, and saying there's something suspicious going on here. It was later we realized that they had actually gone to cut off the cameras. Eventually, as well, they cut off the lights. And who could have had access to the government's source of light, if not government? So lights were cut off. And then what came after was the most horrendous thing ever, most horrific. And then it was just the Nigerian military. We saw men in, in soldiers' uniform spraying bullets, just firing live rounds at peaceful protesters who held national flags, singing the national anthem. And how did we know this eventually? We are grateful for technology. Some of us had their cameras on. Some went on. In fact, there was one of us, DJ Switch is her name, in Nigeria here. She went live on Instagram. And that was how most of us were able to also follow, because we have been protesting at different points, different grounds, running shifts, and just showing solidarity for one another and with one another. But she went on live, and we were able to follow, to monitor, Though it was dark, because, of course, government had cut off the light, but we were still able to make out, you know, sounds. We saw the injured. We saw people dying right before our eyes. But then it was a situation where citizens were helpless in the face of government officials who had been sent to fire live rounds on peaceful protesters who were just there singing the national anthem. So what I told us is that, because, you know, there was also this message that we passed across um, in recent, uh, like, four days ago, we started spreading it around, because in the course of this protest, this sort of same protest, we have also seen the aggression, brutality, everything that we have been asking, demanding, campaigning against, was also unleashed on us. We've been, we've seen the um, aggression of police, we've seen just coming at us and so on. So what we told our people was, Try, when you go out, to go with the national flag. Ordinarily, when any military official sees the national flag or you are singing the national anthem, they are supposed to just respect that. It's a social contract, and that's everything that symbolizes us, that gives us dignity as citizens. But guess what? Everything that dignifies us was, was desecrated that night from what we saw live. People were dying. They were helpless. They were shouting. They were screaming. And this went on and on. So that's what happened on Tuesday. But then that was the anticlimax that happened in Lagos. So the specific location where that happened in Lagos, the protest point is at Lekki. We call it Lekki Tollgate. So there have been other points. Like I personally have been protesting Alausa, um, um, Suru Lere, um, Orile, you know, all of those places. And we have been doing this peacefully and sensibly and in the most applaudable manner. But then the government came, as usual, and applied force and massacred people and injured, maimed its own citizens who were there for nothing else than to ask for their lives to
to be saved and not to be brutalized as it has always been. Because we continue to talk about what's happening in Africa's most populous country. A warning to listeners and viewers again as we report on Nigeria. The coverage includes graphic video and accounts of state violence. In Nigeria, where there's growing evidence to confirm security forces fired without warning on peaceful protesters Tuesday night, killing at least 12 people as authorities imposed a curfew to clamp down on growing demonstrations against police brutality. Some witnesses posted videos on social media where rapid gunfire could be heard. A warning. This is graphic video of state violence. Please tell people, please tell people, people are having to run. They're shooting at them at the Lekki toll gate. Please tell social media. Well, for more, we continue in Nigeria with our two guests. In Lagos, uh, the human rights attorney and activist Adaranke Ige, who is out in the streets, she works with the organization Corporate Accountability and Public Participation Africa. She participated in the NSARS protests. And we now go to Abuja, Nigeria's capital, where Shwari Moile is a Nigerian journalist, human rights activist, founder and publisher of Sahara Reporters. Shwari, it is great to see you. Uh, you've been in prison by the Nigerian state. Now, once again, you're out on the streets. Talk about who the SARS police are, why you were protesting, and what this continued violence against the people of Nigeria means. Thank you so much, Amy, and uh, I'm glad to be on your show. Um, SARS is uh, the Special Anti-Robbery Squad. Uh, it was uh, formed in 1992, uh, apparently to fight uh, armed robbery. Uh, but it was uh, formed after the demise, not the demise, but after a unit of the Nigerian police uh, known as uh, the Kill and Go was uh, uh, kind of arrested because they were committing the same type of atrocities in those days. They were being used by oil companies uh, to suppress villagers and protesters in the Niger Delta region. So SARS is uh, their nephew or cousin or brother, as you can imagine, in the police force, a tactical unit that has been unleashed on uh, young people in particular. And they have license to do the same thing they can and go do, kill, destroy, decimate, extort, invade. But uh, they started having problems recently when they start to stop uh, young people on the street who have dreadlocks, they have their hairs colored, and they extort them, and they arrest people with uh, phones and accent to unlock their phones. Uh, they take them to ATMs to collect bribes uh, and extortion uh, fees. It was crazy, and this has been going on. They've been killing people, uh, young people, uh, without warrants, without any reason, and uh, it got to a head. But let, let me be very clear. SARS is just the alias name for the pent-up anger within the Nigerian society, where young people are fighting over unemployment, over lack of justice, lack of access to the national wealth uh, uh, of, uh, uh, I mean, in terms of oil resources and other resources. And, the fact that the democratic system in Nigeria has started to break down and yield no dividend for the people of Nigeria. So all these young people you see on the street, yes, they are fighting against police brutality, but they are also fighting against army brutality. They are fighting against unemployment. They are fighting against the incompetence and indifference of uh, the regime that has been in power. Uh, who, by the way, sent me to prison last year for five months. Uh, simply because I organized a protest uh, that was supposed to take place August 5, uh, 2019 in Lagos. And they flew me to Abuja, detained me without trial uh, for a long time. A lot of young people are going through the same thing. You know, people are getting detained, jailed for making social media posts on Facebook, on Twitter. It's unbelievable. Nigeria has become uh, a police state, practically. And uh, what you're seeing is a response to all of these abuses. Uh, that has been taking place. And of course, on top of that is corruption. You know, when Nigeria was under lockdown from COVID-19 between uh, February and uh, now, officials were making away with billions of local currency, Naira, uh, which is, you know, millions in dollars, from things as stupid as saying that they are feeding school children who are not going to school. So people are hearing all of this, and uh, social media is helping to amplify all of these abuses. Images are coming out as you know, live instantaneously. And uh, this made people to rise up at once. And uh, I tell you, I was happy to be back on the street fighting on, my, on the side of all these young people uh, in uh, what I call the revolution. And this is what I've always asked for, uh, that Nigerians uh, need to rise up against oppression and fight for their own rights and have a revolution that will give them 
a new order and a new direction that can restore faith once again in what they call democracy here, uh, which is just completely being managed by Mungo Rams. So this is uh, where we are, Amy, and uh, in Abuja, where I participated, the dimension was different. They introduced what we what we call what I call a informal repression. In their own case, in Abuja, they are not sending soldiers to kill protesters directly, but they move in oceans, you know, and hoodlums in government vehicles to attack protesters, and they injured, uh, killed one protester in Abuja that we know of, and they injured a lot of people. As of last night, these oceans being directed by the police and uh, the secret service. I mean, the, the secret police in Nigeria, known as uh, the DSS are going from, you know, they are doing house-to-house -house searches for people they said are leaders of uh, this uh, uprising that's happening in Nigeria. In my own case, yesterday, uh, they went to court to try and revoke my bail so that I could get rearrested. Uh, but uh, luckily for me, uh, lawyers did a fantastic job to work that off. So they are at war against uh, the youth. They are at war against human rights. They are at war against... Uh, the people of Nigeria. And that's uh, what you're seeing is a very, very principled uh, response uh, to these abuses by Nigerians. Uh, and this has never happened before. Uh, even during when we were fighting against the military, I've never seen such coordinated, very disciplined set of young people who have acted peacefully. And what he did in Lagos was to go after uh, these young people, most of them middle class uh, uh, young people who are there peacefully protesting, they were shooting them at close range. They're using war-caliber kinds of uh, bullets that are meant for fighting terrorists and fighting in wars against peaceful protesters at this lucky two gate. Uh, at close range, it's, there's never been anything like that. What made a difference this time around was social media, that this thing was captured instantaneously and broadcast to the world. Otherwise, they would have denied it. As we speak, they are still denying it. They are claiming that... Uh, the casualties were false, and the wounded are recovering, and they're doing all kinds of things to change the narrative, including trying to make it an ethnic and religious issue, uh, but fail the most. Well, Omayele, uh, as you pointed out, these protests are not just about police violence, but about a number of other issues. Uh, but I just want to say that uh, a University of Leiden report in 2016 found that police violence in Nigeria is uh, apparently among the worst in the world, if not the worst, uh, that when police intervene in a, a, a confrontation, almost 60 percent of the time, uh, someone, uh, the police shoot and kill someone. Um, could you talk about uh, as you uh, said, uh, President Buhari's uh, government was responsible for imprisoning you uh, last year just for organizing protests. What has his response been to these protests and the response to his decision to disband SARS? Uh, the reason why people did not take his decision seriously is that uh, President Buhari is uh, tone deaf. Uh, this is who he is. Uh, this has been his character. He was a former military dictator who had uh, carried out killings of uh, people judicially at that time, supposedly because uh, uh, he, some uh, drug uh, carriers that were sentenced, and he brought their sentences forward and uh, sentenced them to death. He's been part of every military uh, regime in the country that partook in. Uh, uh, in abuses of human rights up to 1983, uh, when he took over government, and he continued it, he calmed down the press. And that's what he's doing now, because besides just killing people, besides this whole clam down people, they're also clamping down social media. They have laws to criminalize uh, uh, people who are speaking out against the government. That carries death penalty. They are pushing these laws through the National Assembly, and the National Assembly has become a rubber stamp uh, National Assembly in Nigeria. So this is not new. Uh, this is Buhari's way of doing things. Buhari doesn't believe in human rights, doesn't believe in public opinion. Buhari doesn't believe in democracy. But unfortunately, he was packaged in 19, I mean, 2015 as a reformed Democrat and came to office. And uh, he's just continuing with uh, his own way of doing things. And uh, he's surrounded by people who have the same mindset. And because it suits their agenda to have a populace that cannot speak, that cannot uh, discuss openly, 
and uh, it suits the agenda that uh, they suppress everybody so that they can carry out, uh, they can continue to carry out corruption of immense proportion. So Buhari came to power saying he would fight corruption, but, you know, we discovered even more corruption uh, in his government than uh, even previous governments uh, in the history of uh, Nigeria. So this is Buhari for you. And in rejecting his ban on SARS, people were just saying, look, this is not enough. You know, you have uh, uh, Inspector General of Police, they asked him to be fired, they refused. You had the chief of army staff who presumably uh, ordered these killings uh, or uh, shooting at Lekki. The people have been asking for this man to be removed for years. They, you know, they refuse to remove them because they are there to protect the despot, uh, the Nigerian uh, despot, uh, Muhammad Buhari. And unfortunately, uh, I don't think the international community is doing enough. But hey, you know, this is what they're about, uh, because for them, oil coming out of Nigeria is more important than the, the people of uh, Nigeria. But uh, the good news we have here is that uh, people can now uh, speak up. Uh, they can tell their own stories through the social media platforms that uh, have helped in galvanizing public opinion internationally and locally. And we now have a solid diaspora, too, that has become part of this struggle in a way that has never happened before uh, in Nigeria. Uh, Adaronke Ike, I just uh, could you say we just have a, a couple of minutes. What exactly are protesters calling for now? Beginning, it, it it was about NSARS at first because of the brutality, because of, of what we saw as the indiscipline, the, the 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 way that citizens, ordinary citizens, especially young people, were treated as common criminals just by profiling them and stereotyping and so on. However, it went beyond. It became a thing of, you know, it, it, these things have been pent up over the years, years of indiscipline, lack of accountability, impunity on the part of government officials. So it became a thing of, it reformed the entire police. Their modus, modus operandi is not suitable. We, they, they are killing people. At the same time, the nonchalant attitude of government, especially the federal government, the criminal silence when you need their voice to be loudest. They are totally silent, aloof in a criminal manner. People die under your watch. There's no accountability for anything. Even officers that are named Nothing happens to them. There's no prosecution. Nobody, no justice is being seen as being done, manifestly done. So people were tired. It, it became a whole lot of issues. Now, what the demands were initially, we were asking for um, protesters that were, even in the course of the protest, as we were protesting against brutality, people were still brutalized, arrested, and so on. And we said, okay, release these people already. Then every named um, victim of police injustice, of systemic injustice. We want them to be duly compensated. We want them to get justice just by bringing people to book and then getting appropriate sanctions. We wanted that. Then we want to manifestly see that government is taking action on every other issue, topical issue that we have raised, and we have said we want this to be done and that to be done. For instance, we will tell you here that there's a um, commission that is called the National Human Rights Commission. This commission normally is supposed to oversee all human rights issues, you know, abuses and just um, violations and so on. But let me tell you, even as we speak, that commission seems to be a toothless bulldog because there's no governing council. And without a governing council, what can they do? There has not been a governing council since 2015. Those are some of the issues. But then, so it, it became a thing of, even the NSAS that we were calling for, that, that became the hashtag for all these other um, holistic demands, the government was playing politics with it. So that's the reason you would see, okay, they came and said the IGP, still as we speak, General Muhammadu Buhari has been criminally silent. So let's even leave him aside. Could these the protests bring said, down the government of uh, Muhammadu Buhari? Look, anything can happen at this point because everybody is speaking with one voice. And that's the reason that when they try to politicize this and say, oh, it's this group, is that opposition? No, we can't all be opposition at the same time. We are calling you out on certain things that you are not doing, on the fact that the system is running on injustice and you have chosen to politicize it. So even at, at the point that they said they were disbanding SARS, we said, this, it means this 
people are not listening. They don't get the point. We are not doing a christening ceremony. You can't disband us and then immediately replace it with SWAT because SWAT is going to eventually become a worse form of SARS. So they are not listening. And that is the anger of an average Nigerian. So yes, you are correct. This can totally unseat the government. And this can totally lead to that reform that we have been asking for, to that social revolution, intellectual revolution, even political re resolution. Because right now, what is worse is that instead of listening to the people and engaging appropriately, you are suppressing the people, you are oppressing the people for that. And for how long can you do that? Arangi we want to we'll thank see... you so much for being with us. Um, we are certainly going to continue to cover this. Please be safe. Human rights activist and lawyer now in the streets of Lagos. Nigeria, where security forces gunned down at least a dozen people in the last few days. And Amoyle Shwari, Nigerian journalist, human rights activist, ran for president, was imprisoned by the current Nigerian regime, speaking to us from the capital. Um, for folks who want to see more of our coverage of Nigeria, you can go to our documentary, Drilling and Killing. Chevron and Nigeria's oil dictatorship. Uh, Democracy Now! Uh, went to Nigeria. Um, I covered the Niger Delta with Jeremy Scahill, and we went with Shoya Moyele to the Niger Delta, where we uh, were investigating the activities of an earlier SARS called, as he said, the kill and go. That's the kill and go.